Imagine for a moment that you're Homer Simpson, and one day Mr. Burns comes up to you and offers you an interesting business opportunity. Come to find out, it was super illegal, and you both get arrested and detained. Now, while being interrogated, you see two reasonable options. You could either give up Mr. Burns, or you could remain silent. Now, Mr. Burns is seeing these same options here, and the result of what each of them does can be summarized in this table. If they both decide to remain silent, they'll both end up with fairly short sentences. If Mr. Burns decides to blame Homer while Homer remains silent, Mr. Burns will get no jail time, but Homer will end up with a long sentence. If they both choose to blame each other, then they will both end up in jail for a long time. This is a case of the classic prisoner's dilemma where it's mutually beneficial for the total group for both players to cooperate with each other, while for each individual player it's beneficial to defect, as in blame the other person. I chose to do my inquiry on the iterated prisoner's dilemma, which is just the normal prisoner's dilemma as described before, but repeated for a number of times. Now, the players are received a numerical score based on the outcome of each turn. Those are added up at the end. Uh, if player A cooperates with player B, both of them get 3 points. If player B cooperates but player A defects, player A gets 5, player B gets 0, vice versa. If they both defect, they get 1. Now, higher scores here would then correspond to better outcomes. To code this into Java, I used a for loop that ran for how many iterations I wanted to use. Inside the for loop, methods were called, which corresponded to strategies. The methods would then return either a 1 for cooperating or a 0 for defecting. Inside of the loop, then, the player's scores were added up based on how player 1 and player 2 played, and then the move that that player used is also recorded. Um, some of the methods that were called uh, depended either on simply just returning a 0 or a 1, the move of the player on the previous turn, and the current score of the game. There were five or six different strategies for the prisoner's dilemma based on how you looked at it. Uh, a player could always cooperate. Uh, which is simple enough, uh, or always defect, which would mean that each turn they would always defect. Uh, tit for tat was the most common method. A uh, player cooperates the first time and then copies each player's previous move. Then there's skeptical, which is reverse tit for tat, where the player defects and then copies the other player. Then we have spiteful, which can either be described as cooperating when winning and tied and then defecting when losing, or cooperating until the first defect and then defect the rest of the time. Um, now, these are completely different strategies, but some people will say spiteful is the first option, while some people will swear that it's the second one. On Java, I had all of the strategies run against each other, and got outputted the uh, result for each individual round, as well as the sum of the scores in the bottom. Uh, I was able to summarize these results in a table. In the table, the number on the left corresponds to the strategy on the left, and the number on the right corresponds to the strategy on top. As you can see, tit for tat did very well against all of the strategies except for always defect. Always cooperators seem to do just fine against everyone who wasn't an always defector, and always defectors seem to do very poorly against all of those that weren't always cooperators. The other three strategies seem to have a similar fate to tit for tat, doing very well against everything that wasn't an always defect. At this point, I really started to inquire on my own. I started to look at each of the strategies individually and see what makes them good uh, in order to build my own strategy that could maybe be better than tit for tat, which is you, the typically accepted uh, standard, this strategy is always the best in the iterated prisoner dilemma, blah blah blah, and so forth. Uh, I looked at specifically tit for tat in what makes it good, and I decided that that's um, along with spiteful strategies and the skeptical strategies, it punishes players for defecting. Um, now this is done a turn later. Uh, what sets tit for tat apart from the other ones is that it forgives the player on the next turn if the player chooses to cooperate, where spiteful strategies don't do that. What I tried to focus on when building my own strategy was exploiting the fact that it's not until the next turn that a player is punished for defecting. Uh, simply enough, I try to sneak a defect out of my strategy in the last iteration of the prisoner's dilemma. That way, advanced strategies like tit-for-tat, spiteful, or skeptical wouldn't have time to retaliate. I then ran my strategy ten times against all the other strategies, uh, making a total for six, or seven that is, and tabulated those along with the rest. Um, as you can see, 
uh, my strategy seemed to do well against all the other ones. And I even averaged out a score for each strategy per round against all the other strategies. Um, tit for tat and spiteful ace seem to tie, which I guess kind of makes sense given that they both uh, reward players for uh, cooperating and punish players for defecting. Uh, my strategy, however, beat tit for tat by two points. We can see that difference start to make sense when we think about what happens on the last iteration. Uh, if everything is going right, my strategy will be forcing strategies like tit for tat, skeptical, spiteful a, and spiteful b to be cooperating because they will have cooperated on all the other rounds. My strategy then, having been built to defect on the last round, will win in that last frame by five points. Now, when analyzing this data, the average score isn't necessarily the greatest way to determine which strategy is the best. There are many other things to take into account, like if a strategy is consistent from round to round, or if it's even fair to the other player. I came up with four different ways to analyze these strategies, and each one has their merits. The average score tells you how good the strategy does from round to round against all of the other strategies, while our standard deviation tells you really how consistent your strategy is from round to round, independent of what, you go, what strategy you're going against. Uh, lower standard deviations then correspond to more consistent strategies. <clears throat> Fairness was calculated by looking at each round one at a time. I would take the fraction of the points in that round won by the strategy and then subtract them from 0.5 because 0.5 would correspond to the players sharing the points evenly. I then summed these up for each of the rounds and subtracted them from one so that higher percentages would correspond to better strategies. The last thing I looked at was the win, loss, and tie record. This is important when you think about what you're trying to accomplish with each strategy. If winning is the most important thing, you might be better off always defecting. If not losing is important, you might be better off being a little bit skeptical. And if tying is just good enough, you have a number of options to choose from. When looking at this analytically, it is tough to pick one strategy that is the best. My strategy had a good average score and a good record, but it wasn't as consistent from round to round or fair when compared to the other strategies. To sum up, I was able to use the tools available to me to learn and analyze the prisoner's dilemma. I built my own strategy that focused on winning by looking at what made other strategies work well. Then, I used four different criteria to find that when scoring points isn't everything, the best strategy truly varies depending on the situation in the iterated prisoner's dilemma.